Good morning and welcome to the sixth and final edition of the International Solidarity Series brought to you by World Denver and by the German American Chamber of Commerce. Um, we're excited this morning to focus on education, educators and students around the world and how they are adapting to COVID-19. Um, we've been bringing this series uh, since March, uh, focused on different industries and different areas. And I think we've been from the beginning excited about this conversation, particularly around education, because it touches so many different people and so many different aspects of life. And we have an incredible panel this morning from all corners of the globe and from all different types of education. Um, my name is John Krieger. I'm the executive director of World Denver. World Denver is an organization that facilitates international exchange and global engagement in Denver. Um, we, in a typical year, bring about 600 international visitors from around the world to share expertise and ideas. Um, obviously, this is not a typical year, but we've been uh, attempting as best we can to continue this conversation and to keep global engagement up, even in the virtual space, even when we're all uh, isolating and social distance, we can still be connected. And I'm excited this morning uh, this program mimics, mirrors a little bit what our, our international exchange programs look like, getting together people from different countries as well as uh, someone from here in Denver to, to, to uh, look at our commonalities, our similarities, and to learn from each other too uh, as we're um, adapting. Um, I, am, I wanna uh, highlight especially um, uh, Professor, Professor Guru Prakash who came to Denver as part of the International Visitors Leadership Program as well as uh, Catalina, who is here as a student exchange. And I think we will also be joined with Ryan, um, who is going to be logging on. I think I actually see him popping up right now, who is also a student. And uh, we're all part of our exchange programs at World Denver. Um, the last thing I'll do before handing this off to William uh, at the chamber is first to say what a great partnership we've had um, with the Chamber of Commerce. It's been so, such a pleasure to work together on these events. Um, and I think that World Denver, as well as the Chamber, are committed to continuing to keep these virtual events and the conversations going, even as the Solidarity Series winds down, um, including with an event that World Denver is putting on next week, a week from today, focused on U.S.-Venezuela relations. That'll be on Thursday the 28th, and you can uh, register, and hopefully will join us for that on the 28th. should be a fascinating conversation. Um, but I'm now going to hand it off to William uh, at the German-American Chamber. Uh, before I do, just want to say thank you one more time to our panelists and to our participants from all over the world who are joining us this morning. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Thanks again. All right. Um, so hi, everybody. Uh, my name is William. I'm just getting my camera on. Sorry about that. Hello, everybody. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening. I know people are joining us from around the globe today. Um, yeah, I just want to echo actually John's um, statements in terms of um, welcoming everyone to today's session. Um, we're very excited about the education panel um, and getting started. Um, but before we do that, I do want to point out that um, while I am moderating today and will be asking questions of our panelists, I also invite all of you attendees to ask questions. Um, there is a question button. Um, and usually it's in the right hand side of your screen on GoToWebinar uh, where you can enter questions. Um, I'll be reviewing those as they come in and I can um, start building them to our panelists as well. Um, so a quick introduction of myself. I am the executive director of the German American Chamber of Commerce Colorado chapter. Um, as John mentioned, we're also very interested um, in international exchange, um, but primarily focused on business and trade between Colorado and Germany um, and in Europe to a, to a certain extent. And so we're very excited to welcome all of today's panelists. Um, I would love if we could uh, start with some introductions. Um, maybe we can start with you, Guru, and then we'll, we'll go through the line. Uh, thank you so much, William. And uh, it's truly an honor to be here and uh, be a part of this engaging conversation on uh, the theme of education and virtual learning. Uh, by way of introduction, I'm Guru Prakash, and I teach law as an assistant professor uh, in Patna University. Patna is a, is a, although it's a very ancient city, but uh, presently it's the capital city of one of the most important provinces of the east part of India, Bihar. And apart from my assignment at the university, I am uh, 
also associated with a think tank called India Foundation as a fellow. And I keep writing columns on uh, issues of, of public policy, education, and so on. And it's an honor to be here. And I look forward to this uh, engaging discussion. Thanks, William. Thank you so much. Um, Catalina, could you introduce yourself, please? Yeah. Um, well, um, I'm very excited and nervous <laughs> for being here. Um, I'm from Argentina and I'm from a small city called Almaforte. I am a university uh, student. I am in my first year of system engineering in the National Technological University of Cordoba. And uh, well, as John said, I am a youth ambassador 2019. So I traveled to the US last year and visited them for two weeks. Fantastic. Thank you so much for being here. Um, Kelly, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sorry, I had to unmute my, <laughs> um, my microphone. So I'm Kelly jones Wagey. I am a high school teacher um, in a suburb of Denver, Colorado, um, at Overland High School in the Cherry Creek School District. Um, and I teach uh, mostly U.S. history and uh, government. I teach both American government and comparative government. And then I uh, occasionally host some groups from World Denver um, that come through from the International Visitors um, Leadership Program. Uh, they come through on with education um, backgrounds. So, very cool. Excellent. Um, Sarah, could you please introduce yourself? Hello, my name is Sarah Haslinger. I currently live in Austria, but I'm originally from Texas. Um, I came over here as a Fulbright scholar to teach English and end up staying to study and become an English as a foreign language and history teacher at the secondary level. So, my students are around 11 or 12 years and up, um, roughly equivalent to middle school and high school. Excellent. Thank you so much, Sarah. Then our final panelist is Ryan. Uh, could you uh, please introduce yourself? Uh, hello, everyone. I'm uh, Ryan Belkir. I'm a French uh, high school uh, student. I'm 17 years old. Uh, I study biology, physics, and chemistry. And I am also a uh, uh, former youth ambassadors and I went in Denver and in America uh, last year um, at around the uh, Halloween period. Fantastic. Okay, well, welcome everybody. Um, as you guys can see, we have a broad spectrum here from professors to teachers to students um, of different levels. So we're really excited about um, discussing all points of view today um, in terms of how rapidly everything has changed uh, within education. Um, and maybe we can actually start there, uh, maybe with you, Guru. Uh, it would be great to learn um, what has the past two months looked like for you um, in terms of everything that's going on. Uh, thank you so much, Will. And, uh, you know, one of the best uh, things in this uh, crisis is to share experiences and uh, sharing of experiences among the educators from across the world is going to be a brilliant experience so as for me i teach at the university to postgraduate level students and uh, as you are well aware that uh, people have now adapted to the sort of technology because this is the need of our and uh, we need desperate measures for desperate times although uh, since the last couple of weeks probably in the last four five weeks uh, we are still getting used to the system of online learning and the platforms but uh, i would like to make a point about some of the important challenges which have uh, in fact come across uh, the platforms of online uh, learning so one of the key challenge i think is the level of internet penetration uh, although the government of india has started a wonderful campaign it's called digital india campaign and uh, the campaign envisages to uh, have uh, internet in each and every the village of the country and there are so many villages and the population as we all know it's 1.3 billion as of now but uh, probably by 2025 the government of india envisions to, to have a smartphone or to have a right to internet uh, to a substantial number of people of our country but if we if i give you a statistic of today 
we still uh, roughly are able to reach only 35 to 40 percent of the population through internet so internet penetration is one of the major challenges which i foresee because uh, as you know many platforms of online learning they require high speed broadband and uh, it is still a major challenge so only the spirit and uh, the idea is not going to help but you need the supplementing right infrastructure as well because unless you have the right infrastructure you won't be able to the you won't be able to reach the unreached people who are generally at the margins people who are generally at the fringes because uh, my university uh, is in a part of the rural part of the state so students are from different socio economic background so you cannot expect each and every student to have a macbook or a laptop or a desktop or even a smartphone for that matter although there are uh, in the last couple of years uh, india has certainly has had a massive footprint in terms of smartphones and internet connection but still a massive segment is still left who are untouched with this uh, digital uh, uh, sort of connectivity so that is one of the major challenges which we face and as an educator i always uh, aim for a physical classroom in the sense physical gives you enough leg space and liberty for uh, collaborative learning as well and uh, we are all aware of this bandura social learning theory uh, i'll briefly talk about this bandura's uh, social learning theory illustrate that children learn when they observe and when they imitate others so i was just thinking the other day that is it possible to create learning opportunities that enable bandura's four principles of social learning that is attention retention reproduction and motivation can they be replicated uh, in online classes or not uh, fine there are platforms for peer collaboration and peer assessment uh, google Do Docs is there, Google Drive is there, Google Hangouts is there. There is sufficient number of softwares, but are they serving the purpose or not? That is one of the questions which we need to confront. Online learning, I deeply support of it, but uh, since we are uh, people from across the jurisdiction, people from across the globe, from different countries, I would love to hear your thoughts on how do we deal with these challenges going ahead? Yeah, William. Absolutely, um, and I really want to dive into some of those topics in particular um, i'm going to but I'll, I'll hold off on them i'm just making some notes right now um so before we we dive deeper into those uh in terms of things like internet connection um and and access to even just um like a laptop um i would love to hear from maybe maybe kelly could you tell us a little bit about your experience in the past two months um yeah sure um you know it's been a, a series of, of interesting events. Um, you know, we, we face a little bit of the same challenges as far as, you know, internet connection and things like that. Um, and I was, and you can hear a little bit, I think sometimes in the background, um, as you hear my son um, in the background, because he's, uh, he's six and he just is uh, finishing up kindergarten. And so uh, my husband is working from home and I'm working from home and he is learning from home. And so what we found is that we have two adults in the household and three adults worth of things to do. And so, you know, it's kind of one of the challenges that we've we've found is, and I think a lot of people have found is that you have, you know, people are saying, you know, you can you can telework and you can you can do all of these things from home. But you know, I think people are are finding that, you know, they rely on schools for a lot more than just the education piece um, for for kids. And and I mean that is obviously a huge part of it, but you know, we're we're finding a lot more of of schools you know do a lot more for for our society than just the education piece you know we rely on it for the economy to run for parents to be able to work you know for kids to be able to be fed um and so and for you know the the social piece and all of those other things and so you know there's there's so much more to education than just making sure that that students get and, and kids get content and so, you know, my son is here and he's you know, right down downstairs with my husband playing. <laughs> and so, you know, while I'm doing this. And so I think that, you know, parents are, are really struggling with with how do I balance all of these things and how do I teach my kid when I really don't know a lot of a lot of the stuff that they're really supposed to be learning. And so, you know, as a teacher, I'm trying to figure out how do I get all of the parents and all of my students, everything that they need to be able to learn the stuff that they're supposed to be learning when I'm not there. And, you know, I'm used to adapting everything, you know, as in the moment, you know, when they're not getting it, how do I adapt to them to be able to get it? And I'm having to do that a week at a time instead of, 
in this exact moment. And that's really been a struggle. And at the same time, I'm trying to teach high school and kindergarten. Uh, and those are not the same thing <laughs> in any way. Um, and I'm also, I'm an affiliate faculty member at a, at a university here in Denver too. And so I'm actually teaching high school and college and kindergarten. They're definitely, none of those things are, are the same thing. Um, and so those are all challenges that I'm, I'm trying to figure out and trying to, to find my, you know, find my students. Um, some of my students became essential workers um, because they were working in jobs that were, they were working at grocery stores, they were working in, you know, restaurants, uh, and they became full-time workers when this all started and their parents lost their jobs because their parents were not essential. And so, you know, then I had to go find them because they suddenly started working full time and their parents weren't. And, and that was a, a challenge of, you know, they suddenly stopped going to school because they just weren't available or they started doing work in the middle of the night. And that's when they started turning things in. So there has been a, just a huge shift in, in everything um, and, and how do I find them? Cause I can't see them every day anymore. Um, and their, their siblings started staying home. And so they started helping their siblings with school and, there's just been a, a shift that I, I couldn't have imagined um, a couple of months ago. Uh, I, I feel like I've been hearing a lot about adapting schedule um, and even like, as you mentioned, uh, folks with children, uh, not only are you on Zoom and your partner's on Zoom, but your kid is on Zoom and now your bandwidth is messed up and now no one can access anything. <laughs> um, it's It seems like there's there's, all sorts of scheduling uh, difficulties that have been um, happening for everybody. Um, Sarah, could you give us um, any insight into uh, what's going on in Austria schools? Absolutely. Um, so over here around March 10th is when things started to shut down. And as you said, things happened very, very quickly. Um, within about a week, all businesses and schools were shut down. However, children of essential workers are allowed to go to school here. I should say we're allowed because of as of Monday, now schools have reopened. Um, so during that two month period, the children of essential workers could go to school where they were essentially, I wanna say babysat, but there was someone there with them, not necessarily teaching them, but with them while they did their schoolwork, um, which was otherwise done digitally remotely while everyone else was at home using platforms like Teams or um, Moodle, various um, platforms. As of this past Monday, schools have reopened um, and it's kind of on a shift basis. So half of the class goes back on Monday, went back on Monday while the others were at home doing their work and on Tuesday, the other half came in. So we have, a sense of normalcy coming back. However, things are still very, very different. Since, uh, certain classes such as PE or music or anything considered an extracurricular is no longer an option for the rest of the year. Um, this is at the elementary through high school level. Uh, and universities are still digital for the remainder of the year. Um, and Yeah, pretty much the same thing that everyone else has been saying. Um, issues with internet, depending on the socioeconomic background of the student, sometimes very difficult home situations where friends of mine had, or colleagues of mine as well have been trying to reach out to the students, trying to make sure everyone has internet, um, provide access for them if possible, same with the laptop, um, making sure that they're okay at home, whether that is psychologically in their home situation, that, they're, that they have the extra support they need for those students who would otherwise need it in class or maybe now need it more so. Um, so as Kelly had said, quite a shift and quite a challenge at this moment. Um, I would love to hear from um, our students um, to give us the opposite side of the spectrum uh, and what it's been like as a student during all of this. Um, Catalina, uh, at the university level, um, what, and this is your first year in university, I believe yeah, you mentioned? Um, wow, <laughs> what, a, what a year to start. Right? <laughs> um, could, you, could you tell us a little bit about your experience so far? Um, well, the school was canceled about March 16th, so I didn't have a chance to go a single class in my university. 
and it's been quite a struggle at the beginning because um, the teachers didn't know exactly how to give us the classes so or what platform to use was what virtual classroom did they want to use and it was hard uh, because we have a lot of information coming from a lot of different uh, places and um, yeah and we have to make a, make a, a virtual wall uh, like padlet to um, to try to organize all the information we had um, from different places and it was like a team group with all the students so yeah, because it was a really uh, big mess. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, I just one more quick question for you. Um, in the United States, uh, what's pretty typical for university students is they'll stay in uh, university housing, so dormitories um, that are uh, op the operations come from the university itself. Um, is it similar for you, um, or are you in like an apartment, or maybe with? No, uh, we are on our houses, and we go to like like it's a high school, but it's it's the same almost. <laughs> we okay. uh, stay in our houses, and we go to the university to have classes. Um, gotcha, great. Um, and then Ryan, um, you are uh, at the high school level. Um, could you tell us a little bit about your experience so far? Uh, yeah, it has been challenging for for, for high school students, uh, mostly because uh, in France they have cancelled uh, all exam, so we all have our degree now, and uh, to find motivation to work um, on online classes, it's very difficult because, um, as uh, everyone said, uh, social disparities and uh, social backgrounds uh, is a uh, a key role uh, to to find motivation as a student because um, for, for myself, uh, for example, I will study computer science next year, and I know that um, history or geography won't be um, uh, my main subject next year, and it's difficult to, to continue to work on uh, this subject uh, even if I have already my degree. So I think motivation is uh, is the most important thing uh, as a, as a student now. Uh, because uh, also um, when you are in a family with five or six siblings and the uh, internet is struggling to have uh, all these uh, classes uh, at the same time, uh, it's also difficult to, to find the motivation to try to fix it and to try to, to be uh, uh, consistent uh, to follow these, these classes. And uh, now, now that um, uh, lockdown is over in France, um, it's it's uh, harder because we can't we can go out we can meet our friends now and uh, to just stay home and uh, walk home with our environment uh, which is probably for most students very um, uh, not very uh, healthy uh, to walk because we have uh, whole bedrooms um, no or computers or video games uh, very uh, close to us it's not it's not the, the same environment as a class, so as a classroom. So yeah, motivation, I think, it's the the main issue uh, for students. And and you're in your final year of high school, correct? Yeah. Exactly. Um, so That's have, why uh, I have my degree uh, now. Right. So so they're awarding the degrees. Um, do you, in in the United States, there's a lot of um, chatter about things like graduation ceremonies. Um, are there ceremonies like that for you as well in France, and have they been cancelled, um, or what? What's going on there? Is it just whatever? <laughs> um, I think, um, except from uh, private schools uh, in France, we don't have really um, uh, like uh, celebrations for degrees. Uh, maybe uh, yeah, for private schools. So everything has been cancelled. The uh, and the uh, I think uh, students don't even care because they just have their degree 
they know that they will go to university next year and uh, that's just the, the, the important thing uh, for them. Um, well, so I'd actually love to expand on that subject with the rest of the panel. Um, perhaps some of the teachers and professors could let us know about what has it, the end of the year looked like in terms of um, maybe Sarah with the Matura or with um, graduation uh, or even things like the SAT and the ACT tests, uh, the standardized testing. Um, could you guys give us an, any insight into uh, what's happening there? Uh, maybe we can start with the American perspective, actually. Uh, Kelly, could you give us some insight? Yeah, sure, I can do that. Um, so um, all, at least here in Denver, all standardized tests got canceled this year. Um, so um, we, we made it to the ACT because we did ours in February. Um, so the kids took the ACT in February. Um, but other than that, um, the SAT was scheduled for April. And we were out of school on, um, we canceled school on March 13th. So March 13th, we were finished and we, we didn't go back after that. So they didn't do any standardized tests. We did no state standardized tests. So um, that, that just was canceled. Um, they are looking at possibly doing some this summer um, where students that need it for scholarship reasons can go in and do um, standardized tests, but that was it. Um, students who did advanced placement courses, um, the college board changed the advanced placement classes to do online exams. So they canceled the multiple choice tests and moved it to a couple of um, free response questions and the students did online. So they signed up to take the test, did a couple of free response questions that were open note and open book, and that was all. Um, so that they could um, take their tests that way since they had taken the courses for the entire year. Um, but that was all of the standardized tests that we had. Um, as far as end of year celebrations, um, I teach a lot of seniors. Um, so it was their last year of high school. And it, this was really, really difficult on them. Um, senior year of high school is really important um, for a lot of, of American high schoolers. There's a lot of celebration that goes with finishing up high school. And that usually comes around March and April is when those celebrations take place. Um, there's prom, so there's the, the kind of dance that goes with it. So there's their senior prom, and there's all of the, the, they have a senior prank that they sometimes do. And there's graduation and all of the kind of celebrations that, that go along with that. And I think that my seniors especially, um, when we left, because it was right around spring break, um, they left and they were thinking like they got an extended spring break and they were going to have an extra week off. And that first couple weeks, I think they were okay. And when it started sinking in that we weren't coming back, they really, really struggled. Um, and they, they lost their motivation um, for a long time. Um, and you know, there were a lot of them that I had to call and, and check and see how they were doing. And they just were not okay. Um, losing graduation really hurt for a lot of them. Um, because for some of them, they're not going on to university. And so this is the only graduation that they were going to, to have. And so, you know, their parents had been looking forward to watching them, you know, walk across a stage and get a diploma. Um, for some of my students, they're the first ones in their family to graduate. And so they were the first ones to be able to do that. And their, their families had really been looking forward to seeing that. They'd worked really hard um, to do that. Um, and so they won't get a university graduation. Um, and so it was, it was pretty heartbreaking for a lot of them uh, to lose that piece. And I know that our school district just released a, a information that they are gonna hold an in-person graduation in July for them. Um, so they are gonna do that. Um, the students are going to be, and some essential faculty are gonna be the only ones allowed to attend, um, it sounds like, and so, um, they're going to live stream it where the students will be you know, able to get their diplomas and they'll be able to wear their cap and gown and do that. Um, now that may change as health orders change, but they will get to do that at the end of July. And so that students will get to you know, wear their cap and gown and, and do the graduation ceremony at the end of July. So people are, are trying to just kind of move heaven and earth to make sure that they get that ceremony piece that they, they didn't get because actually their graduation was supposed to be tomorrow morning. And so, yeah, that piece was was important. 
And so they're trying to also celebrate a lot of those pieces um, for them. So we're going to have kind of a, a thing on Tuesday for them where when they come to actually pick up their diplomas on Tuesday, um, the you know, faculty will be there and the kids, and even though we'll have to all wear masks and, um, you know, be in our cars and socially distance the, the kind of, you know, gauntlet of stuff so that when the kids come get their diplomas, they can be recognized for it. You know, Definitely it's, it's, memorable. It will oh. be that. It will be that. <laughs> so, you know, we're trying to do everything that we can to celebrate them, but it has been very hard on them. So to lose those pieces. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's so, it's such a staple of American culture. I feel like every single American high school movie incorporates the dance and the graduation ceremony. It's, mm -hmm. um, it's a big piece of uh, American culture. Um, mm -hmm. Guru, how about um, with you? Uh, can you tell us about um, end of year testing um, and, and what that's looked like for your students? Uh, yeah, well, uh, I think it has been a great challenge for us because as far as uh, evaluation and examination is concerned, we actually rely upon uh, a set of question papers and then students come, they sort of analyze and uh, they are supposed to uh, interpret it and write it on their own uh, uh, perspective but this time we are definitely going to miss that entire process and the entire examination paraphernalia uh, but I think priorities are different because more than ceremonies in India students are eager for employment opportunities and uh, rightly so because uh, once you get a college degree once you graduate uh, you are eligible for uh, many of the jobs and now with this uh, crisis uh, there are a lot of companies who are uh, initially uh, planning to invest in china and there are a lot of corporations who are already in china they are planning to shift their uh, base to india so in the coming future in the emerging future there is going to be a great need of manpower manpower human resources not in the terms of qualified human resources but in the terms of skilled manpower people with a lot of skills as well like i made this point initially about the demographic dividend so the entire education infrastructure, the government, the policymakers, the think tanks, they are putting a lot of uh, investment into it. That how do we make our manpower, how do we make our uh, human resource more quality oriented and uh, uh, more productive. So India is going to be at the center of uh, the new world order, if I can say such a thing. Because if you look at many of the factors like uh, the economies are emerging, uh, the population, I think uh, more than one third of the global population reside in this uh, region and uh, it's uh, thriving democracies as well. So India, I think the global power access in that sense, which used to be on the Europe and the US side, it is going to decisively shift to the Indian Ocean, from Pacific Ocean to the Indian Ocean. Because you see a lot of emerging economies and a lot of the established uh, developed economies as well in terms of Japan and Australia as well. So this is going to be an epicenter of the future, not only in terms of education, but also in terms of uh, industry, in terms of the fifth generation of uh, industrial revolution. So uh, beyond examination, I think uh, the government uh, is uh, sort of planning to make uh, our uh, youngsters job ready because uh, we are hoping that uh, a lot of international companies like uh, uh, there is this controversy i read about in the us that there was a bill introduced uh, in the us senate about uh, being cautious or probably uh, shifting uh, the manufacturing companies american manufacturing companies out of china so we are looking at this as an opportunity well and uh, and rightly so because uh, leadership uh, as uh, we see emerges in the times of crisis and uh, we are fortunately led by uh, the Prime Minister Shri Narendra Modi, who at the cost of political risk announced the lockdown very early in this stage. And it saved us. It gave us a lot of time to prepare our hospital infrastructure, to prepare our health infrastructure, to get the number of beds, the ventilators and so on. And uh, thankfully, the mortality rates, the death rates have been uh, very controlled so the new imagination the new vision is going to be very comprehensive and has to take into account all these factors the role of india in the new world order the role of the leadership and the sort of demographic dividend who are going to decide the future of india and the region yeah well
Absolutely. Um, actually, with, with that, uh, maybe we can go to Sarah. Um, and I would love to hear from you about um, these sort of end of year tests as well. Um, but also, I'm, I'm, I know that Austria has um, a, maybe a similar setup where not everyone goes to gymnasium and not everyone goes to university as well. Um, and maybe you could touch on that a little bit as well in terms of uh, what different paths are available for students. Absolutely. So in Austria, um, you have various school options after elementary school, um, which is the US equivalent of about fourth grade. So when you're around 11, you decide where to go from there. If you go to the gymnasium, where you prepare for the university, or to say a special school where you learn a trade or um, you specialize in a certain area and do an apprenticeship. So there are many different routes that students take, um, which is different than in the US where you go to high school and some then go on to college. Um, if you go to a certain type of school, that's sort of definitely your path. And those are the ones that have the end of year exams called the Matura that you mentioned earlier. Um, so I'd like to touch on that for a minute. We don't really have the same sort of graduation here as you do in the States. You have what's called the Matura Ball, which is like a palm that does not necessarily take place at the end of the school year. It kind of depends on the school. So some were able to have it um, depending on where they go to school. Um, and you don't really have a ceremony where you walk across the stage. So this, they aren't, can you still hear me okay? Okay, my headset just said something. Okay, sorry about that. Um, anyways, and many students then go on what's called a matura visa or a trip after graduating, and that's their big thing, which of course will be canceled. Many go to Croatia or other countries, which is not an option right now with the borders being closed through June 15th and then limited um, border crossings after that. Right now with the matura, students would normally have normal classes through roughly um, the beginning of this semester. And then they have preparation courses where they only focus on the matura and these exit exams, if you will. It's kind of the equivalent of a high school de degree, uh, excuse me, high school diploma and the SAT or ACT. So it is standardized. It is what gets you into college. It is your college entrance exam, if you will. And this is the focus right now. So these students are excited to no longer have these other classes to focus on. They only go to school to prepare for the exams, and then they have free time to an extent. And once the exams are over, they're done. Um, the oral portion of the exam, there's an oral and written portion, was canceled. So instead of having the grade based on the oral and written portions, um, it is half written, which begins May 25th, um, and it will only be in three subjects. For most, it is English, excuse me, German, a foreign language, sometimes English, and math. Or if you go to one of these technical schools, as I mentioned, um, or you have a different, not college geared school, I guess I put it that way, um, not a gymnasium, then maybe you have an engineering course or something specific to your school. But you only have three exams as opposed to others. So for me, there was no, will not be a history exam taking place, which is one of the more optional ones, um, the one that you select. and. These exams um, began preparation on May 4th. So these students went back to school a little bit early, um, but the rest of this time, they've been having to prepare by themselves. They had to partake in some of the other courses and then motivate themselves, at, touching back to what Kelly had said. Um, so they don't get to have the fun, easygoing times with their friends aside from studying. They don't have the time focused on the exams um, in the classroom with their classmates to kind of end everything in their, their school um, period. And so I've heard a lot from students, just as Kelly said, not being motivated or trying to, to find the discipline to study on their own, which in part could be an advantage when they go to the university and have to do that for themselves as well, um, yeah. as far as writing term papers and things of that sort. But it's been quite a challenge um, for them finding the motivation, um, and and really making themselves study and prepare for that when they lose all of the, the benefits that go along with it. Um, and the final thing I wanted to add on that is that these exams were set in place 
or excuse me, were, were started as sort of like a standardized version um, a while back to have um, the, the college entrance exams and the grading of them to be more objective. And right now, half of the grade for when they graduate is their class grade in that course, they say their English grade for the year, and the other half is the written exam that will take place in a few weeks. So you have a lot more, yeah, flexibility, I would say, possibly subjectivity um, on the teacher's end as far as what grades the students end up with. And this determines possibly what university they go to. If they wish to study medicine, they need to have the top grades. They might not, depending on who the teacher is um, or what the relationship is. The teacher is unfortunately that happens sometimes um, where people don't grade subjectively or objectively excuse me um, so I would say that's the big thing here as far as graduation and end of year um, thank you um, so we're in the final 15 minutes um, of today's call uh, I do want to remind uh, our attendees that they can ask questions and if you have those to please um, submit them I mean, we'll try to make sure that we can get to them. Um, motivation seems to be a very big topic here. Um, uh, I would actually love to hear from the students. Uh, maybe Catalina, uh, could you tell us, um, uh, again, you're a first year student uh, in university experiencing uh, a lot of messiness. Um, what has been motivating? What has um, been working well? Um. Well, motivation is a thing, <laughs> obviously. Um, but I think that it, it, also, it always depends on the, on the professors and the classes, the virtual classes they give, because if they, um, if they are happy and they want you to, you know, to give classes and they are motivated, they transmit the same motivation to us, the students. Um, Can I ask um, you, um, Kelly mentioned that she is uh, calling her students, which I believe probably, I mean, it's been a while since I've been in high school, but that, that wasn't normal for me. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, is uh, how are um, teachers communicating with you? Are they also calling you, um, or is it all done through email? We have virtual classes uh all all week like if in normal time like it was a normal class but all all in zoom um yeah they communicate through through this method and yeah that's it and they solve our our questions and they explain the topics and we are very warm <laughs> Okay. Uh, Ryan, how about with you? Um, what, what has been motivating? Um, and also, I would love to hear how uh, teachers have been communicating with you. Yeah, um, I think from my perspective and my friend's perspective, um, we have been motivated because we know that we have time to do what we, we won't be able to do um, if there wasn't uh, the lockdown. Uh, and uh, also because we want to be um, as much prepared uh, as we can for next years uh, at university, college. Um, and uh, I, I think also our parents are pushing up to work uh, harder uh, and every time. And uh, that's also what uh, all teachers do because we have also um, every, uh, every week's uh, class, uh, online classes virtual classes, we are, we have uh, also emails that have been sent by our teachers. So they also try to motivate us to work, uh, even if we don't have a um, test at the end of the year, because uh, they want us to be as, as well prepared as we can uh, for next year. So I think uh, the perspective to, to have also um, other diplomas in uh, next years are our main motivation but it's it's very hard for um, for certain subjects that we know that we won't have uh, next year's but we try to do it uh, as much as we can absolutely um and now both of 
you, Catalina and Ryan, um, were involved in exchange programs um, prior to today. Um, question for the panel. Um, this is, uh, and this is a question from one of our attendees, um, actually Paul Maracal, the German Honorary Consul. Um, are you seeing fewer students applying for exchange programs um, at the university level as a result of the coronavirus? Um, are universities reluctant to continue programming for foreign students because so many of their classes are now online only? Um, and I think that actually pertains to the high school level as well. I'm wondering if, um, if anyone would be able to speak to that. Uh, I can volunteer. Uh, yeah, that'd be yeah. great. Uh, no, I don't think so because uh, we have to learn to live with this virus. And I think viruses in the past, the, be it Spanish flu, be it the plague, they have they came and they went on in the sense that they are not going to stay here and hold the civilization process. And uh, as far as the exchange programs are concerned. Uh, they are extremely beneficial uh, for a student or for uh, young uh, uh, aspiring uh, academics or the young leaders as well like us because it broadens your horizons and uh, makes uh, helps you make connection as well. In fact, uh, this conversation is a part of uh, a connection which I made in Denver and uh, when I was in Denver in the month of July of 2017 and I'm deeply grateful to uh, Miss Norma Horner, who is a part of World Denver, and uh, because of her, I'm a part of this uh, conversation. So these relationship, these uh, sort of engagements are very critical to one's personality development and uh, one's uh, broadening of perspective. So as far as the question of virus is concerned, I'm sure like people have learned, people will evolve, the viruses will evolve, and the virus will go away eventually. There are uh, vaccines being developed, uh, so it is not going to have uh, a major impact because uh, we also learned that the Olympics are now rescheduled uh, and uh, will happen in the month of July uh, 2021. So when a big event, when we, so the idea is that the exchange of individuals and the exchange of information, the power of globalization uh, won't stop and uh, our goodness as humanity, our goodness and as uh, the mankind will definitely prevail over this uh, virus hopefully. So I'm optimistic in this regard. Well. Great. That, that's good to hear. <laughs> um, it, uh, another question um, from the audience uh, from Dr. Prabhakar, um, and excuse my pronunciation if that's incorrect, um, but uh, another question for the panel, um, what type of learning would be mo most suitable for this COVID period um, and how can students be engaged and what will be the evaluation criteria for award? Um, so and, and I think that actually is a a great lead into another question that I had in terms of um, there's obviously a lot of changes right now. What do you see being temporary and what do you see as sticking around uh, past uh, the virus? If anyone would uh, care to answer that question. Uh, I have an answer if I, if I can. Please. Uh, I think um, in France we have uh, a very old um, school system. Uh, it hasn't been changed since uh, I think uh, the French Revolution. So technology was a big thing here because teachers um, don't, didn't want to use it. I don't know why, but they they did didn't just uh, want to use it. And I think now that uh, most of them try to manipulate them. Uh, I think it will be um, a thing that they will use um, more and more next years because now they know how to use it uh, for most of them, and uh, I think they uh, they understood how powerful that could uh, that could be, and uh, how they can uh, fix some issues that they have with certain students that weren't um, as uh, engaged as uh, they probably should in classes. And now that there is uh, another tool to, to teach, um, I think they will probably use it uh, more and more. Um, and yeah, as, as Guru mentioned, uh, necessity is the mother of invention. Um, teachers had to turn on a dime with all of this <laughs> and move all of their classes to um, this online learning environment. Um, so it's, it's really impressive. Uh, so all of you, thank you for doing everything that you're doing. 
Um, we are in the final five minutes of this. Um, the way that this solidarity series has been going, we love ending on a um, an optimistic note. Um, so I'd love to hear from each of you um, in brief, if, if possible, to be cognizant of time. Um, what are you optimistic about uh, with, with everything that's been happening? Um, maybe it's changes, maybe it's the way you see things going or getting better. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, could we start with you, Guru? Oh uh, yeah, definitely will. Uh, certainly like uh, one thing which is going to stay with us uh, in this crisis is the impact and the relevance of online education because uh, the websites like Coursera and certain other websites, which has already been on internet for uh, couple of years now so it's not uh, difficult for a student sitting in Bihar sitting in India to have a course from a professor in uh, Oxford or a professor in any of the Ivy Leagues in fact I myself uh, have enrolled uh, in a very interesting course in Coursera it's called moral foundations of politics so education is uh, now going to be accessible every sort of uh, information and there are now uh, debates on uh, open source as well. So if you are producing any uh, qualitative research, if you're producing any good article, it has to be available. Uh, that is my personal opinion that uh, it has to be av available for the public at large. But at the end, I would still, uh, it's my very strong belief that a lot would depend on uh, the uh, structure of uh, digital uh, sort of influence in countries. Because unless uh, you have access of internet, unless you have this smartphone, uh, uh, you are actually you will actually be bereft of uh, massive opportunities which might come your way. Like I said, there are many good courses, and the future of learning, I would say, the future of uh, university uh, will undergo a transformative shift, which was even uh, during the pre-COVID days. But COVID will uh, definitely sort of accelerate. Uh, uh, in a sense, the future of learning and will have a deep impact on it across the globe. Yes, Will. It's some really interesting points, um, especially because if you look at the immediate moment, we have a lot of closed borders. Um, but uh, in fact, it, it could actually increase globalization and the global conversation. Um, so it's, it's a really interesting point. Um, Catalina, could you um, give us some optimism? Well, I think that every situation we experience is a experience of learning. So everything we are learning now to do with technology and education, it can be used in the future for any problems that could search and yeah, that, that could appear. I think it might be useful in the future a lot. Great. Thank you. Um, uh, Kelly? Um, I think for mine is is the the kind of deep appreciation of of how important experience is because it's really hard to have them right now. Um, you know everything has to be done and experienced virtually, and, and that's hard. Um, and I think that that at the end of of this, even though it won't be the same, I think the the appreciation for being able to experience things. Um, you know, the, the number of my students that are talking about being able to to go places where before they were a little nervous about going places that were not here, now they are, are talking about all the places that they want to go and all the things they want to experience um, they before were nervous about doing. And I think that that um, makes me really happy <laughs> um, that, that they're ready to go experience those things that before they were they were more nervous about. So. I'm I'm excited for that that moment when they all get to go do that. Absolutely, and that, so. that actually goes back to that that question about um, exchange. Uh, I wonder if this will actually motivate more people to do so once we can, um, uh, especially as we have these more global conversations as well. I mean, conversations like this one. Um, Sarah, uh, how about from you? I'm going to say something very similar to Kelly. Actually, um, I think this has sort of made us reevaluate our our priorities um, and and get a new perspective on things, especially how important being social is, whether that is in the classroom, seeing students, watching them learn things, being able to um, discuss things with them in the moment, as opposed to via email or um, just reading their words that they've written in a text, for instance. 
Um, and, and beyond that, beyond the classroom, um, just social interaction in general. And, and I can only hope that we will be more appreciative of that in the future. Um, and as a positive as well, I think parents are more aware of what all goes on in schools and in education in general. Um, and hopefully that sticks around as well. I'm sorry, my mic was not on. Uh, Ryan, if you could, <laughs> um, if you could uh, let us give us um, some optimism. Yeah, uh, I see uh, in my my city um, more and more um, people who are working together, uh, who has been uh, involved in um, community service, uh, and um, I think that it's a, it's a thing that will stay in the future because. Uh, lots of people have realized uh, how important um, voluntary uh, was and um, and how powerful it could be uh, in a, in a community and uh, and so I think it's uh, it's a good thing. Absolutely, uh, I hope John. If I know you're on the line as well. I hope you don't mind me saying, but I feel like this is like the most optimistic way to go out with this series. Actually, like everything that everybody said. Um, was touching on very different perspectives um, of this, and I, I'm feeling motivated for the coming year. So uh, I, I do want, uh, we are at the end of the hour, so I do want to thank everybody for their time today. Um, it has been an excellent discussion. Really enjoyed learning from all of you um, in terms of what's been going on and what's going to be coming in the future. Um, so again, I uh, just want to do a quick thank you, and then also a quick plug uh, for both uh, World Denver and the GACC both of which are membership organizations. Um, so we are supported by our members who um, are not only members of the organizations, but also support events like this one. Uh, we host events in person too, and hopefully we can do that again soon. Um, John mentioned at the start of the hour, they have um, a call coming up next week. Uh, the GACC does as well. So keep uh, an eye out for an email on that, uh, where we'll be talking, uh, shifting topics entirely to Brexit and COVID um, and where Germany stands uh, amidst all of that. Um, so again, thank you everyone so much for your time today. Uh, we were really excited to have you. Uh, yeah, have a, a great day or evening ahead. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Namaste. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.